A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment is a nonprofit organization supported entirely by your donations. If you've ever enjoyed one of our podcast episodes or classes, please consider making a donation of any size right now on our website at skepticspath.org. I'm Scott Snibby, and this is A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment, where we share practical ideas from Buddhism to build happier lives, stronger relationships, and a better world. Nearly 30 years ago, Stephen Batchelor wrote a book called Buddhism Without Beliefs that's become a foundational work for those seeking to adopt Buddhism into a non-religious form while still maintaining the power and authenticity of its time-tested practices. I had a chance to speak with Stephen Batchelor recently from his home in France, where he shared his own creative struggle with Buddhism, from his origins as an ordained Tibetan Buddhist monk to becoming a skeptical agnostic who admits that he simply doesn't know the answers to life's biggest questions. So Stephen Batchelor, it's an absolute pleasure to have a chance to speak with you. Your books have been very, very influential to me. And I have to say this particular book, The Guide to the oh. Way of Life, when people ask me, you know, there's this thing called the Desert Island book, the book you, if you yeah. could only bring one book to an island for the rest of your life, honestly, it's your translation of this text. It's the one we studied. And I've even compared the different versions and how you soften things from like evil to wrongdoing and so on over the years. So thank you for writing that. I've compared it to the other translations and yours, I find the most poetic and and powerful. So thanks, thanks just for that and the many other things we'll talk about today. Thank you. That's kind, yeah. I cut my teeth with classical Tibetan translating that book. I did it when I was in my early 20s, and it was such a wonderful experience. Not just the, you know, the translation process itself, but the whole experience of getting close as one can to a figure such as Shantideva. And then you had, you know, as they say, a crisis of faith, you know, as we call mm. it in the West. So can you just start off by talking about your journey from someone deeply committed to traditional Buddhist doctrine to where you are today? Basically, I set out for India when I was 18 years old. I left my home in London, near London, uh, went over land, as many of us did, and ended up in Dharamsala in 1972. And they were then offering courses to Westerners. And it was the only place, I think, really in India at that time. I also became a novice monk at that period. And then when Geshe Rautin was appointed abbot of the Tibetan monastery in Switzerland, I went with him uh, as part of a small group that he wanted to, or offered really, to train in the, the Geshe studies. And we had to do this in Tibetan because at that time, none of these texts were translated or very few of them were available in English. I accepted those doctrines, but they didn't rationally make sense completely. Uh, so that was my faith, as it were. I was very much committed to this uh, project. But at the end of the day, I found that the arguments, for example, for rebirth simply didn't cut the ice. Uh, they were not even valid arguments in terms of the Tibetans' own criteria of what constitutes a valid argument. And I found that really logic was being used basically to prop up faith. So I did run into a bit of a brick wall with the training in philosophy. But I think also probably what contributed more to my crisis of faith, as you put it, was not so much my difficulty in accepting certain arguments that, that I could have dealt with. It was, I think, the fact that there were certain elements within Tibetan Buddhism that I found very challenging. One of them was guru devotion. I was extremely close to Geshe Rautin. He was one of the men who certainly had the most influence in my life and continues to do so. So nothing personal to do with Geshe -la. But the idea of somehow giving away my autonomy to another person, as the Tibetan texts say, giving my power, Rang Wang, to the guru's Zhen Wang, his other power, and surrendering myself in that way was not a practice that I could really do in good faith. The other problem was that I didn't find that the Vajrayana practices, particularly 
that I'd been initiated into and I was practicing on a daily basis really were actually working for me. It really didn't speak to me. Or let's say I got to the point where I realized that this was just not my way. And I used that moment to follow a, a, a longing, an intuition, a, an attraction to Zen Buddhism. Uh, which for the Tibetans, of course, is a kind of uh, something you don't go near. Uh, but um, uh, I'd always been drawn to Zen, both to the art, to the quirkiness of it, and to some of the texts. Uh, the whole Chinese approach to Buddhism I found very attractive. And at that time, there was one place in Korea where you could go as a monk, uh, a monastery that would accept my Tibetan ordination, and that was in Songwangsa in South Korea. And there was a handful of, of other Westerners training there. And that was, for me, enormously uh, helpful. I'm not suggesting at all that it somehow supplanted or was better than my Tibetan training. In fact, what I found more importantly is that it became a very good balance from all the study I'd done, all of the text I'd read and translated, all of the ideas I'd struggled with having this contemplative uh, component very much sort of put my practice into balance. I did feel that Tibetan Buddhism, as, it, as I knew it, was still very much enclosed within the kind of medieval culture that uh, the Tibetans uh, had had until they left Tibet in 1959. And I didn't see much movement towards much willingness to reform or change this system. And for that reason, my writing has primarily been an ongoing struggle, both for myself and perhaps for my readers too, to try to figure out, you know, what is this stuff all about? Intuitively, viscerally, uh, I kind of, you know, I'm very, very much embedded in Buddhist tradition. I am a Buddhist. It's very, very important to me. It's what has really constituted my life's work. And yet I feel that sometimes that Buddhism is doing itself a disfavor by retaining and holding on to and teaching ideas that people, uh, many people in the modern world uh, simply can't swallow or simply do not engage with at all. And I feel this is a great shame. I, mean, I feel that perhaps my work can help the Dharma reach people who otherwise would not find it easy to access through traditional Buddhist uh, traditions. You're not just someone who deeply explored a couple of different Buddhist traditions, but you're also grappling with perhaps creating a new tradition. How does Buddhism arrive in the West? And uh, what is Buddhism without beliefs? Your famous book, the title of your famous book, which I read in my early Buddhist journey. So, some people I know are scared, of, scared to even read your book. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. When I tell people I read your book, they're like, oh, I don't want to read that. I, I wasn't scared to read your book, and I loved it. I find it very strange. That, I find it very disturbing, frankly, that people are scared of reading a book. That troubles me, frankly. Uh, it, it's not, you know, I wasn't brought up in a culture in which you were scared of reading books. We, I mean, books are human, they're, they're human heritage. And the Gelug tradition also is always saying, don't just believe this stuff. You know, examine it as a goldsmith would examine gold. You know, don't just take it on faith. And that surely is about exploring and questioning and so on. And I certainly, you know, people think that I, the, 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 that I dismiss reincarnation, that I don't, you know, I think you think it's wrong or something. Uh, that's not my position. It never has been. Uh, I take an agnostic position. In other words, I just honestly acknowledge I don't know. And that, to me, is much more interesting than taking a position either pro or contra by believing in a lot of this metaphysics, rebirth and karma and different realms of existence and so on, on the one hand, and then denying those things uh, as though they're just sort of childish nonsense on the other. Uh, that I'm interested in the middle way. Uh, and an agnostic position is one in which, in, in complete honesty and respect, I have to admit that I do not understand this. It doesn't make any sense to me. It seems to me that you know to, to think you in order to study Buddhism, you have to first of all download classical Indian cosmology and metaphysics, and then you begin your study. 
to me, that doesn't make any sense. I can't imagine if the Buddha were to appear in the world today that he would first of all try to get everybody to believe in reincarnation. He might. I've absolutely no idea, but I doubt it, frankly. But who knows? And um, and also, was there a moment for you? Like when when did you break out of you know, the tradition entirely and start thinking along these this original line of thought? I think probably one of the one of the key points was when we actually studied the arguments for reincarnation, because uh, there I was in good faith. I'd been told that you know this would sort the problem out, but it doesn't. It just pushes the problem one step back. You know, it only works that argument if you believe that consciousness can only emerge from a previous moment of consciousness. Uh, if you believe that, then yeah, of course it works, and that's the presupposition of the argument. You know, that's not very helpful. And I think one of the attractions to Tibetan Buddhism was precisely because it offered something I'd been de been deprived of as a young man, as a as a kid, really. And of course, I was ex extraordinarily drawn to the Tibetans themselves, and not just the lamas, but the ordinary Tibetans I got to know who lived in Dharamsala. I thought these people embodied something that you know we don't have. I'd never come across in my life in London, and I was very, very drawn to that. And a figure, someone like His Holiness Dalai Lama, for example, you know, he's someone who, who radiates these qualities, and that too served as an enormous uh, confirmation that following this way uh, could be enorm enorm enormously valuable and fruitful, not just for me but for others. Buddhism in Tibet is, you know, is something that emerged through the encounter between what came from India, from the Nalanda tradition, basically, in India, and then engaged with what was going on in Tibet in the 8th century and later in the 11th century, and how it was through the interaction of these two cultures that what we now call Tibetan Buddhism, which I don't like that as a term, but nonetheless, I think it'll do, that it emerged. And Tibetan Buddhism is very different from, say, Japanese Buddhism or Sri Lankan Buddhism. And so another thing if you want sort of key points as to what made me question, would be the awareness that all forms of Buddhism that one can experience and encounter in Asia are also terribly different, not because one of them is right and the rest are wrong, which is often how traditional Buddhists see it, but actually because they've emerged out of very different uh, conditions and circumstances. In other words, Buddhism is an example of dependent origination. It's something impermanent, it's something that's conditional, it's something that's imperfect, it's something that's inessential in itself, which is exactly what the Dharma teaches. And so there's nothing particularly uh, sacred or holy about any particular form of Buddhism. They all work well. They're very well adapted to the cultures in which they emerge. But I don't really feel that you can just transpose them into, say, modern California. It'll work for some people. I have many friends uh, you know, I've known for many years who are perfectly fine and happy with that particular approach. But I also know through the communications I get from people who've read my books, from the programs I give, the talks I give, and so forth and so on, that there's lots of people out there who have either become disillusioned with Buddhism because they simply cannot take on board some of these beliefs or these devotions to these lamas they fly through once a year or whatever it might be. And yet they do, like I did, intuitively feel there's something incredibly valuable. But Buddhism, it's kind of getting in the way of that. So when you're coming back to your point about starting another tradition, I certainly don't see myself as the founder of a tradition. It's, it's uh, something that actually makes me a little bit... Uh, uh, you know, very uncomfortable, to be quite honest. Something you wrote is that the Dharma is not something to believe in, but something to do. Yeah. And I think most of my teachers would agree with you that the core of Buddhist psychology is an understanding that you know certain thoughts and actions lead to happiness, others lead to suffering. So can you just talk practically about you know how you practice Buddhism without beliefs? So this journey is one that's moved from Buddhism being something to believe into Buddhism is something to practice. I would also question whether, in fact, Buddhism is about being happy or somehow no longer suffering. I, I find that's it's, it's very vague. And also, 
frankly, it's not in the end what I'm primarily interested in. I'm practicing the Dharma not in order to be happy, although I'd love to be happy, that I'm sure for everybody that's a basic human need. I'm practicing the Dharma because I want to lead a, a rich and full and meaningful life, even though that may entail a lot of trouble and difficulty and hardship and conflict and pain. That doesn't matter. What matters to me far more than happiness is meaning and purpose. And meaning and purpose is something that I've got to work out for myself. Buddhism can provide me with a, a framework, but the actual practice of this is not a practice so that I don't feel so unhappy and I feel happier, although that would be a lovely byproduct, but is my life being rendered therefore both more meaningful for myself and more meaningful for others? So rather than noble truths, I'm talking of noble tasks. To embrace life, to let reactivity be when it arises, to notice and to see it come to rest, to stop, to notice these moments of non-reactive stillness and quiet, and from that stillness, that emptiness, if you wish, that openness, that then provides you with the foundation of cultivating a path, specifically the Noble Eightfold Path. This reframing of the first noble truth, fact, whatever you want to call it, as embrace life, this is one of my very favorite um, things that I've read in your work, because I do really think it's a very um, perhaps inappropriate translation might be, you know, a nice way to put it. Um, you look around and life is not always suffering. <laughs> Where Are we suffering right now through this conversation, right? So embrace life. And it also really resonates with the, the Mahayana view of, um, yeah. you know, the beauty you, you can find in reality. So I, I really love that. Uh, tell me a little bit about your your agnostic perspective on enlightenment. You know, even among different Buddhisms, there's different views on enlightenment. One, you know, the Tibetan view is often total omniscience, total awareness, ability to manifest yourself in many bodies in different forms to benefit beings and perform miracles, things like that. The Japanese version is maybe a, a little more like a beginning. You know, the Satori is like, oh, now my now my path starts <laughs> now that I'm awake. What is your take? I like to think of awakening far more as a, as a process of waking up than as a reaching some sort of sublime goal. There are certainly within that process moments of insight. The Eightfold Path is what really matters, frankly, and not as a way to the end of suffering, which is the standard Buddhist way of looking at it, but actually as the way to arriving at another kind of world. It's a moment in which your life turns around in a way, shifts away from a life basically driven by habit and reactivity and conditioning and so on, to a life in which you find an inner freedom, a freedom from reactivity, from greed, from hatred, moments of stillness and clarity. And that is what then opens up the possibility of living radically differently in this world. And we find this, uh, again, in a, in a very famous uh, parable the Buddha gave. We find it in the Pali Canon. I don't know whether it's in the Tibetan. But it's about the man who goes into the forest and he finds an ancient path and he follows the ancient path and it leads to the ruins of an ancient city. And then he gets the king and the ministers to get the community to rebuild the ancient city. When he explains that, he says the path is the Noble Eightfold Path. And the city is what it leads to. And the rebuilding of a city is what the practice is about. It's about creating a civic space, a space in which we can live together on this earth that is run, or let's say organized by um, the law of the Dhamma, the Dhamma meaning, of course, law. So in other words, it's about the creating of a kind of society, a community, uh, rather than bringing everything to an end in nirvana. Yeah, a beginning, not an end. So I want to go back to the analyses you had of mm -hmm. some of the, the these arguments, because I had this, I had exactly the same react. I'm a, I'm a mathematical, you know, scientific type of thinker. Mm -hmm. I studied computer science, was good at math. And I had these same 
reactions as you when I learned these arguments. You know, here's the argument for continuity of consciousness. To me, it was quite obvious that was a very poor argument because it rested on an axiom that consciousness was immaterial, for example. Similarly with the arguments for karma and so on. So I agree with you on those. Here's my question for you though, is like, let's say reincarnation in particular. I'm just curious about your direct experience with living teachers who've been recognized as reincarnated, who say they're reincarnated, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, a lot of my own teachers, I'm old enough now that I've seen some of my teachers die and met their reincarnations. I just had lunch with Yangtze Rinpoche a couple of weeks ago, who was a reincarnated Lama. So how did, this is, this is where I, I'm so happy to talk to you. So I'm so curious why that wasn't convincing or, or how those experiences worked into your own beliefs and views, because having spent so much time with, quote, reincarnated beings myself, that for me has become firmer evidence than these somewhat poor arguments. Well, to be honest, that hasn't been my experience. I recognize that many of the most you know, impressive people I've met have been tulkus, have been reincarnate love. But I'll give you an example. While I was in Dharamsala, Geshe Rabton, my teacher, started having dreams about where his teacher may have been reborn. He then went to the junior tutor, Trijang Rinpoche, and Trijang Rinpoche was having similar dreams about where this lama was being reborn. He'd been left behind in Tibet. They tracked him down to Manali, and they went into the house that they'd seen in their dreams, and this young boy races out, and he says, uncle, uncle. Very impressive, right? So this young uh, boy then came with us to Switzerland, uh, Los Anten Tenzin. I, I, I knew him quite, uh, quite well. And basically wasn't interested in Buddhism at all. In fact, and this I found very sad, was that towards the end of his life, Geshe Rabton had to admit, Kong Yabom Indu, he's so good. Despite the story of the dreams and so on, which of course ticks all the right boxes, in the end, a young man's childhood has basically been taken away from him. He's been thrown into a world that he has no interest in being in. And he's not the only one I've met. There's lots of young men who have been recognized as reincarnate lamas who've dropped out of the whole thing. And they've been disillusioned. And I think also it's, I think it's, a, it's an almost cruel thing to do to a child, is to take them out of their maternal environment, their family environment, and, and, and basically, you know, train them as, as young monks from young age. It works for some people. In fact, it might have worked very well for me, to be honest. I'd love to have had that education from the age of 10 or 12. I mean, great. But uh, probably a lot of people don't. So to be honest, the, the empirical evidence that you cite does not impress me at all. Um, it, it, in fact, uh, it makes me rather concerned about the whole system. And, you know, that's kind of where I'm at with that to be honest. Yeah, that makes sense, you know. But even His Holiness, though, has said, I'm only sure about three or four of my predecessors, you know, like the fact that the the process is fallible doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% fallible. Just to push you a little bit on this. That's not to say that on occasion it doesn't work. It does it produce some wonderful people. I'm not sure, though, that you would not get the same result were it done basically on a merit-based system. I think probably at its best, the Tibetans developed a skill over the centuries in recognizing what we would call the gifted child. At its best, I think that's what happened. Why is the child gifted? Is it genetics? Is it karma? Who knows? The point is, certain kids uh, show from a young age that this is a very bright, promising child. And I don't think there's much more to it than that, to be honest. We don't need to, we need, don't need to bring reincarnation into the picture. You mentioned art practice. I wanted to get into that. Here, I have a quote from you. Dharma practice is more akin to artistic creation than technical problem solving, which I love because I myself am a kind of a combination of an artist and technical person. And you've written in other places and essays about the overlap of art and Buddhism. You practice various forms of art yourself. I, I'd love it if you could talk about how spiritual practice is like art, how actual art practice relates to Dharma. Before I was remotely interested in Buddhism, I was very much drawn to the arts. My, my family has artists in its 
And I was very much a person when I was at school who was in the humanities, not the sciences. I mean, this to me was the only way to go. And um, But when I became a Buddhist monk, I stopped all artistic practice again because I was told to. Monks don't do this kind of stuff. I remember once one of our monks uh, wanted to go to the local church in Switzerland and play the organ. Geshe Rab said, no, you can't do that. That's music. So I've always grated a bit against that. That's one of the reasons I was drawn to Zen, because Zen values the practice of the arts. Instead of demonizing art as a distraction or something that takes you away from the path, it saw it as a practice in its own right. And that's how I see my own art practice. I don't see it as a, as a, as a sort of my hobby, but I see it as my work. I see it as very much my integral part of my Dharma practice. Now, I think the practice of art is basically one way of responding to the situation of life. In my case, I work with collage. I've been doing this now for about 25 years. I make collages out of found materials, things people have gotten rid of, thrown away as rubbish. And then I reassemble them according to quite strict grid mosaic patterns. And I see this both as a way of trying to embrace life, trying to recover the things that the world considers to have no value, and then restore them to a work of art. I'm actually going to get one. Can I get one to show you? Oh, yes, please. I'd really like to see one. Okay, Scott. This is, um, this is one. Oh, that's right. great. Very uh, kind of Albers. It's not as though I'm trying to copy it. It's, a, it's my own process of making these things so has evolved through its own logic into the sequences of collage that I made. These take about a year to make one of these things. And because I have to find all the materials, I don't buy any materials. Uh, I have they have to be uh, scavenged. I enjoy it because I can't explain it. I do it not because I'm trying to prove something or show something. I'm doing it because I'm moved to do so. And I've got into a flow over these years in which I no longer worry or think about what I'm going to do next. And I find that my process now as a writer and my process as a collage artist have actually merged. So to me, the artwork has actually infused and I think illuminated not only my written work, but also my practice as a human being, as a, as a Dharma practitioner. It's given me, I don't know, a kind of a very necessary counterpoint to my intellectual work. All right, let me ask you about one of life's other big boundaries and mysteries. Um, I've had some powerful experiences with these death absorption meditations that I'm sure you've practiced from Tibetan Buddhism um, and also at the bedside of people close to me as they died. And and I, I dare say you might have had those experiences mm. too. So how do you feel about your own death? Um, curious, scared, open-minded? <laughs> what, what, what attitude do you have? Well, to me, death is the great test of life. The most powerful meditations I did as a Tibetan Buddhist monk were the nine-round death meditation in the Lam Rim. I still teach that. I think it's an incredibly powerful practice because it enables you to recognize that the only certainty in your life is that you will die, and that could happen at any time. And I was drilled, maybe that's what you meant by death absorptions, I don't know. But that was the practice that really impacted me, of all the Tibetan practices. That really reset my whole sense of being a human being. And I live with that every day. I don't know what will be the next, whether I'll still be here tomorrow. And that's a, real, that's a reality for me. That's what drives me in my deepest passions as a human being, as a writer, as an artist, and the various other things I do. And death, therefore, is to me something utterly inseparable from life itself. With your current stance on Buddhism, 
what's your own experience and perspective on what happens when you die <laughs> and what might come after it? Well, I have no preconceived ideas at all as to what will happen after death, but I'm also open to the possibility that it could well be something that we cannot even conceptualize, that we're looking at death from the point of view of a living being with a brain, and that living being with a brain is going to die. Therefore, what may in fact happen after death could simply be almost infinitely beyond our comprehension. And that kind of prospect fills me with a sense of wonder and awe. It's beautiful and it's nice. It's wonderful you can feel that without having to have any belief about all the different stages you go through as you die, just, just a pure open-mindedness toward it. As a last question, I wanted to ask you, as you look back on your you know, career, if you want to call it as a Buddhist, is there anything today you'd amend in your earlier writings and your thoughts about uh, Buddhism without belief? I see each book that I've done as something that has achieved a particular purpose at that time in my life, and I'm going to leave it alone. It has a life independently of me now. You have your copy on your desert island, <laughs> and so forth and so on. And I'm just so delighted that um, these books uh, disappear, go off into people's homes and libraries and people read. I, I, I don't know what people do with these things. And that's, that's really, really the great joy of being a writer. And I have the, I'm very fortunate in having been able to be published uh, by, you know, quite widely in different languages. So, you know, I've been very, I've been very blessed in a way by having that opportunity. Um, yes, of course. I mean, recently I had to make an audio book of Living with the Devil, which I wrote in 20, 2004. Normally, I, once a book is written, I never read it again. I mean, why would I read my own stuff? But on these occasions, I do have to read it again. I have to read it out loud in a studio. And uh, I find myself arguing with it the whole time. I, I'm, I, I <laughs> um, you know, I, this is a very badly made sentence. I could say this so much better. So I, I redo it. And then the, the producer in the, behind the glass will say, no, you can't change anything. You can't change anything. So yeah, I can see all manner of ways in which I could improve what I've done in the past. I read stuff that I no longer agree with. Buddhism without beliefs, I don't fully go along with all of that anymore. But I'm still operating within the Four Noble Truth frame in Buddhism without beliefs. I bring in this idea of tasks, but as a kind of an adjunct to the truths. I'm still trying to explain the truths and trying to figure out how craving causes suffering and so on. So I clearly wouldn't do that anymore. What I would like to do um, is to write another book um, like Buddhism Without Beliefs, um, but for our times now, I would like to have another go at doing the same kind of thing, but I certainly wouldn't adapt or change or revise Buddhism Without Beliefs. That has its own autonomy now like a work of art has autonomy. Buddhism Without Belief is actually commissioned as an introduction to Buddhism without using any Buddhist jargon. That was my brief. And uh, it turned out to be something rather different, um, which I hadn't intended at all. Um, and I'd like to give that another go. Yeah, I'd like to read that book. I think that would be a great contribution now that you've uh, iterated mm -hmm. so much on it. So Stephen Batchelor, thank you so much for this conversation. Your many books and your ways of thinking have greatly influenced me. And it's a delight to talk to you in person and feel like the heart and the curiosity and the presence of the human being <laughs> behind it. So thank you so much for speaking with us and for everything you've done and will continue to do for bringing Buddhism into our modern era. Thank you very much, Scott. It's been a lovely conversation. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us for my conversation with Stephen Batchelor. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider making a donation to our podcast. A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment is a nonprofit organization. Our podcast is free and ad-free thanks to our generous donors. To support us now, visit our website at skepticspath.org. We accept cash, credit, Bitcoin, and other cryptocurrencies, and your donations are tax-deductible in the U.S.
If you'd like to deepen this conversation, please join our private meditation community and newsletter through the links on our website or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thanks to Annie Nguyen for production and story editing, Christian Parry for mastering, and Isabella Asabal for marketing. We wish you a wonderful day. 